What's going on, you guys? Your boy Ben Mahari here, represent Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. Much love to all my subscribers out there, all my basketball people out there, and also not to the brothers of the LDBC. You know, doing the thug dizzle out there, man. Now, I got a few more videos that I'm going to be loading up before the end of the day here, and so bear with me as I try to you know get all these videos up before the end of the day. But I wanted to particularly talk about this nomination here. Um, the one of the greatest you know international stars in Europe. Uh, Tony Kukoc, who played with the Chicago Bulls during the mid-90s, is now entering into the 2021 Basketball Hall of Fame. And I've been saying to myself, it's long overdue as a proud Bulls fan. You know why? Because Tony Kukoc should have been in the Hall of Fame a long time ago. Okay. Now, I'm going to get into some of the critics about this pick in just a few minutes here. Okay. But bear with me as I'm talking about this. Tony Kukoc, to me, is one of the great European stars that really helped pave the way for a lot of the great European players that you see here in today's NBA. Now, when he was growing up in split Croatia, you know, his father was devoted to athletics, being that he was playing actually soccer and playing as a goalkeeper for a low rank uh, local club. And so basically possessing the great moral skills, you know, Tony was pretty much grew up participating in different sports like table tennis, uh, soccer, and he especially excelled at table tennis as an adolescent, winning pretty much youth uh, titles at titles as a ten, as a te table tennis player. But then eventually, as he grew up into his teens, he started developing his love of basketball, and he started playing basketball right around the ages of twelve to thirteen. And then he started playing basketball much more seriously as he got older later on. Now. He began his basketball career playing for his hometown club at the age of 17. And he already and then after that, he this is where he started achieving, you know, success. Uh within the prestigious Euro League as the team won it three consecutive years between 1989 and 1991. And his team also won the Triple Crown uh, award in 1990 and 91. <clears throat> and he was awarded the Euro League Final Four MVP in both of those seasons. Now, then after that, as the uh, Yugoslavian uh, country was going through was going through civil war at the time, he moved to the Italian League and won Italian League championships in 1992 and won the Italian Cup in 1993 and also played in the Euro League final in 1993, winning the Euro League final for MVP once again. Now, in terms of his international career, um, he was on the junior Yugoslavian under-19 national team that won the 1987 FIBA under-19 World Cup, where he was named a tournament MVP. And he was also on the senior men's Yugoslavian national team that won the silver medal at the 1988 Summer Olympic Games that also featured, you know, great Hall of Fame players too as well. You know, guys like, you know, guys like, you know, uh, Drazen Petrovic, you know what I'm saying, uh, Vlade Divac, you know, those, those great players. And so... You know, Vlad, those guys were phenomenal players. And basically, those three guys alone really helped pave the way, along with Oscar Stanley of Brazil, that really helped pave the way for international players to be shown well in a big-time stage. But the sad part about that team was is that that team, their success didn't last long because once all the politics that took place at Yugoslavia broke apart. And once the country got into civil war, that pretty much broke the country completely apart into, into little separate countries. Even today is when the team completely fractured, you know, relationships were fractured. I even remembered, you know, the ones for once, the once we were once brothers documentary between about Vlade and the relationship with Drazen, they were pretty much close friends. But once the, but once the wars happened, it pretty much fractured their relationship. And, Unfortunately, they never spoke to each other again and never had the opportunity to re to basically, you know, rekindle the relationship because Drazen basically died in, I think it was like June of 1993 when he had his uh, tragic car accident in Germany. And so Tony, you know, and Vladi never really, you know, make up, made up with one another until like 2001. And I think there's a video on YouTube that... Pretty much, you know, saw them, you know, met, you know, you know, giving themselves, you know, pleasant, positive pleasantries when Vlade was in Sacramento and when T Tony was in Philadelphia. And that was probably one of the very first few times that they pretty much, you know, spoke with one another after the wars were pretty much over with. But, you know, Jerry Krause, 
obviously saw the talent in this kid and he was pretty much wowing, you know, the reporters and re and basically talking so much to the team that it developed a personal animosity of uh, towards towards Kukoc and when the guys to like Michael Jordan and also Scottie Pippen. Now, they didn't have an issue with Kukoc personally because at the time they didn't know him, but they took Kony Kukoc as like a figurehead an extension of Jerry Krause. And so in that same 1992 you know, Olympics, when Tony was playing for the Croatian national team, you know, Pippen and Jordan took turns defending this dude, basically bumping him, you know, playing physical defense against him, basically trying to ruin his confidence. You know what I'm saying? And if you saw the last dance documentary, you knew, you knew what was, where, where this was headed. And they pretty much embarrassed and humiliated this kid to having the worst game of his entire life. But give Kukoc credit. You know, he came back after they saw him again in the, basically in the gold medal game in the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona and pretty much had a better game, even though Croatia was pretty much blown out of the building. He came back and scored, you know, 17 and actually it was 19 points against the uh, the USA team. And pretty much it gave Jordan and Pippen some respect of Kukos that, hey, you know, this kid is much tougher than they thought. And let's be real about something here. Those guys grew up, basically live in a, lived in a war-torn country. They weren't afraid of anything. OK, they weren't afraid of, you know, these, you know, these great, you know, USA players at the time. You know what I mean? They went through a lot in their lives. So I'm saying the whole thing I'm saying is, is that they were they, they saw some stuff and stuff in their own native country that these got that these professional players in the NBA didn't weren't previous to seeing. That's all I'm saying. Now, after the Bulls won their third straight championship. Kuko was actually was going to answer with the was going to make his uh, debut with the Bulls that season. But ultimately, Michael, you know, made his early retirement and ended up being the sixth man off the bench. And that pretty much what he, you know, made his career off of. You know, he made his career of being the sixth man off the bench, you know, because he wasn't going to play above Scottie Pippen and he wasn't going to play above Oris Grant. But then the next year in 95, he Horace Grant left for left as a free agent to Orlando and became, you know, the starting power forward. And pretty much his scoring averages increased up until Michael Jordan came back. And then Kukoc was pretty much the sixth man and earned, you know, his sixth man award by averaging 13 points per game, uh, three and a half assists, and four rebounds while shooting 77 percent from the field and 47 percent from three point range. So, all I'm saying is that Kukoc really much made his bones. You know, as a six man, you know, if he were playing on another team as a starter, he could probably average at least 20 points per game. The only issue with Kukoc was is that he was a 6'11", you know, slender uh, forward, only about the weight, weighing 2, 230, 235. And so he had to really learn and adjust to the physical style of the NBA at that time. It wasn't it is. It's not like the NBA that it is today, where it's basically open court style basketball. We don't have to worry about guys bumping into each other. It was a pretty much a different game back then. And so for him to average pretty much at least to 11 points per game during his career, during that physical style, is pretty much remarkable. But also that if he had the opportunity to play in today's NBA with the abilities that he had, a 6'11", with a feathery touch from outside, you know, a great passer, he can handle the ball as a point forward, he probably would average at least 20 to 23 points per game. Max would be 25 considering the fact how much the NBA is more open court style now and where big guys are encouraged even more to shoot from the outside. And so I think he would have done wonders in today's NBA. I really do. And so, you know, after his years in Chicago came, came to an end, you know, he was pretty much traded to the Philadelphia 76ers, you know, where he played behind Allen Iverson, you know, Aaron McKee, you know, Theo Rathless, and then eventually during that 2001 season, the same season that the Sixers made the finals, he was traded to the Atlanta Hawks and then played it at least, you know, four seasons with the Milwaukee Bucks before he calling it a career. Now, the thing that people need to understand is that, you know, Kukoc, his career was made by his achievements in the international scene. You see, I've seen people, you know, taking the task talking about how garbage the, the, this, this selection is, and this, that, and the third. What people need to understand is this is not the NBA Hall of Fame. This is not specifically the NBA. This is the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. 
they select guys that's not just dominated the NBA. That has a lot to do with it, but that's not the only criteria. They look at guys who dominated, you know, in the international scene. What have they done in the Euro Leagues, in FIBA, you know what I mean, in the Italian Leagues. All right, those are the cri- that's the criteria that a lot of these writers look at. And they have international writers, I'm sure, in those committees that look into those things. And a lot of the American, you know, journalists out there that may cover the, you know, the international basketball scene also look those things into consideration as well. And so when I hear people, you know, talking about how garbage this thing is, you really are you really are just close minded to the whole process because it's not just about the NBA alone. All right. We need to get that mentality out of it. And I will admit, I was for a few years close minded to the fact because when Dino Raja got into the Hall of Fame, I said to myself, man, that's a garbage pick. This is ridiculous. But then an OG talked to me about it and said, hey, listen, this is not just about the NBA. This is the this is this is basically an, an international Hall of Fame, too. Not just American. They look at the entire resume of all the players from around the world. And and that's when I realized, holy crap. He's right. So to, as of now, and as of, of, as of last year too, I've been pretty much more open-minded about that whole entire process. You have to really understand, you know, the whole entire scenario. Yes, there's going to be a lot of players that might be left off of the Hall of Fame, but you have to look at the entire resume of a player and look at what he did, not just in America, but also, also what he did in the international scene. All right. And I will say this though, too. And I know, and I want to make sure to make this very clear with the same one I'm about to say right here and now. If that Yugoslavian team did not went through that entire ridiculous war in the 90s, all right, if the entire Yugoslavian team was still unified and still together, they probably would have had probably a good shot of possibly challenging them, challenging the dream team in the gold medal game. I'm not saying that they would have beaten them, all I'm saying is they probably would have had the better better opportunity of challenging the Dream Team and making them sweat a little bit. Even though I still will tell you that the Dream Team was still going to beat them. All I'm saying is with the talent that they had, because Drazen Pepevich was a deadly shooter with great with a great up fake and excellent passer. And with Vlade Divas working inside, you know what I mean, and basically doing his finesse game too. And he was a good passer from the high post. All right. All I'm saying is that Yugoslavian team might have been the second best team that may have not won the gold medal, in my view, behind the Soviet team with letting with Arvidas Sabonis. You know, and that's another thing, though, too. People also trashed about how Sabonis got into the Hall of Fame. You, ha- Like I said before, this is basically the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. It's not exclusively just the NBA. And I'm going to be straight up with you. If Sabonis didn't have to go through those knee injuries at the time when he was playing for Lithuania through for the Soviets. All right. If they didn't make him, you know, return back to basketball immediately and let him, you know, heal his, his knee injuries. I'm going to tell you something. That Portland team with Drexler, Buck Williams, Jerome Kersey, Terry Porter, those guys, you add some bonus in place of Kevin Duckworth. I'm telling you right now, the Portland Trailblazers would have won a couple of, a couple of those championships and probably would have beaten the Bulls during the early 90s because they ain't, listen, Sabonis so could pass, he could shoot, and he was a powerful center in the paint. He was pretty much Shaq-like. So let's let's calm ourselves down when we talk about which is a very bad pick. Because at the end of the day, Sabonis got deserves to get in. Drazen deserved to get in. Vlade deserved to get in. Dino Raja deserved to get in. And yes, Tony Kukoc, you know, deserves to get in into the basketball hall of fame. So Let's end the cap once and for all about this, okay? But that's just my two cents on the whole thing. Congratulations to Tony Kukoc, who is now the third member of that Bulls dynasty to make it to the Hall of Fame, you know what I'm saying, along with Phil Jackson and Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinstorf, the whole, you know, set of great Bulls teams during the 90s. But that's just my two cents. You let me know what you need in the comment section below. And with that, I'm out. Peace.